Hello and welcome back to Vidorama, where we remember the VHS releases of the past in graphic detail. My name is Arvod Jones and I'm an artist, and each month on this channel I paint a tribute to a movie that we rented on video back in the day. As you can see from my drawing, I will be painting a tribute to Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, continuing my mission to paint a tribute to each Friday the 13th movie and releasing it on each Friday the 13th. Got it? There's two this year. If this is your first time here, don't be put off. This isn't the finished picture. I'll add a bit more detail and then we'll transfer it to card. I'll paint it all up, add some detail and I'll tell you all about it and the film as I do so. I'm trying to hold back uh, on the detail. Uh, there's no point putting too much detail as I'll only end up painting over it. So it just serves as a guide. If this is your first time with us, uh, welcome. Um, as I mentioned before, this is part of an ongoing series that I hope to do. Um, I started this challenge last year with part six, Jason Lives. Uh, follow the link and you can see that video. Now I'm happy with the sketch, I'll take it over to my trusty photocopier. You see, despite knowing I'm gonna paint all this, I still went ahead and added all that detail. The paper is basic cheap photocopy paper, A3. It's not uncommon for me to actually use old photocopies and draw on the back. Standard copy A3, please. And while you're doing your thing, I will get my paint ready. There we go, it's faint, but it still serves as a guide. Uh, this is now on thin card, uh, bright craft card. 300 grams? You see, it needs to be thick enough to take the paint and not warp, but thin enough to pass through the photocopier. So back to the drawing board and mind not to trap my finger in the clamp. The colours I'm using today are Mars Black, Titanium White, Brilliant Purple and Bright Aqua Green. And so we will start off by mixing black and white and achieving a dark grey to serve as the night sky. I say this every time, but uh, when it comes to a large amount of space to get maximum coverage, I will use my finger and apply the paint that way. To eliminate brush strokes, um, which can be rather frustrating when you're scanning your painting afterwards. I mean, I've been told that um, some of you like that, that uh, it looks more like a painting and not something that's been done on the computer. But anyway, let's discuss the movie itself. Five years after The Muppets, it was now Jason Voorhees' time to take Manhattan. This film was written and directed by Rob Hedden, and it starred Jansen Daggett, Scott Reeves, Peter Mark Richman, and Kane Hodder returns as Jason Voorhees. You rarely see this one at the top of the list of fan favourites, mostly as it doesn't completely deliver what it promises in the title, but I think it has its charms. This movie was picked by Patreon supporter Alex Taylor, who feels that it doesn't receive enough love. Okay, the movie's plot. An undisclosed amount of time has elapsed since part 7, and we find a sexed up teenage couple on a houseboat cruising Crystal Lake. The boat's anchor snags on some underwater cables, and this electrifies the corpse of Jason Voorhees, still chained at the bottom of the lake. He wakes up, and having killed the cruising couple, his new wave of terror begins when he stows away on the SS Lazarus, which is about to leave the harbour with its newly boarded passengers, which comprise mostly of graduating seniors from Lakeview High School on their way for New York City. Our doomed youths are chaperoned by two teachers, of which is Dr. Charles McCulloch, who is both a biology teacher and uncle to Rennie, who suffers from a fear of water. So, as you can imagine, being surrounded by the stuff, it triggers her. She sees visions of a young Jason, while the real Jason sneaks around the ship, killing all the students and crew members he encounters. 
including the captain, who incidentally is the father of Rennie's boyfriend, Sean. As the passengers are whittled down to a few, they accept that Jason isn't a legend, and they then realise that the ship is taking on water. So McCulloch, Van Heusen, Rene, Sean, Julius and Toby the dog escape on a life raft, which gets them safely to New York. Naturally, Jason is in pursuit, and he continues to stalk and kill them one at a time around the Big Apple. In his own imaginative, wonderfully violent way. Bless him. Naturally, I will also include the Movieland Theatre, which closed down in March 1989. But, I've decided to put a reference to another movie that was released in 1989. And, uh, if you get the reference, we could be friends. But going back to part 8, as the box office returns on part 7, The New Blood um, had been fair, Paramount decided to green light another 13th movie. New Blood's director, John Carl B. Clear, was already developing a follow-up that saw the Tina Shepard character returning to the franchise to take Jason on once again. Even teen actress La Park Lincoln had written a script along the same lines. However, the project was instead offered to writer-director Rob Hedding making this his debut movie. From California, Rob Hedding, while a student at Laguna Beach High School, started making short films. With aspirations of becoming a director someday, he enrolled in the Brooks Institute. After graduating, he worked at Universal Studios and he would sneak onto TV and movie sets and learn the directing process for himself. Having provided screenplays for such shows as Alfred Hitchcock Presents and MacGyver, he struck on the idea to write scripts, but only sell them to studios that agreed to allow him to direct as well. It worked. He was approached by the makers of Friday the 13th, the series, who were desperate for stories, and they reluctantly agreed to let Hedden write and direct the episodes The Electrocutioner and 13 O'Clock. Happy with his work, they offered him the chance to write and direct the new Friday the 13th movie. Despite not being into horror, he believed it would be a learning process for him, and so he accepted. Aware there had been seven movies before, and that they had all taken place at Crystal Lake, he wanted to try a different approach and take Jason away from the lake. He asked if he could relocate Jason, and producer Frank Mancuso Jr. agreed. And so Hedden wrote two scripts. I would like to get as much of Times Square in this painting as possible because apart from the fact that it's an iconic shot of Jason standing there uh, any excuse to paint 1980s New York I touched on this in my Street Trash tribute I've always been fascinated with that dirty grimy pre-Giuliani New York filled with litter and graffiti, neon lights, hookers up and down the streets and uh, toxic waste seemingly flowing through the sewers. I think it's because it seemed like a world so far removed from my own growing up in a small village in North Wales. In fact, when I finally visited New York I was somewhat disappointed with how much Times Square had changed. Um, it didn't resemble the Times Square I'd seen in all these movies. That's progress for you. Going back to Hedden's script ideas, he had one story taking place on a boat with Jason killing the crew, a la Alien, and another taking place in a big city. Mancuso liked the idea and suggested that it be set in New York. And so a somewhat ambitious story that had Jason in New York chasing people on the Brooklyn Bridge, climbing the Statue of Liberty, boxing in Madison Square Garden was written, but quickly scrapped when Paramount refused to fund the cost of shooting on location in New York. And so Hedden trimmed it down and combined it with his boat script. As part of that before-mentioned cost-cutting requirement, most of the film took place at Vancouver, British Columbia, with some shots being filmed in Los Angeles, along with a few days of shooting on location at New York's Times Square. And yet, despite the cost-cutting, Jason Takes Manhattan was still the most expensive film in the series, with a budget of $5 million. Those of you that watched the previous video will remember that I mentioned a tradition within the franchise to name each movie after a David Bowie song in order to keep its production a secret from the fans. This story was called Ashes to Ashes. At some point it was then retitled Burial at Sea. 
firmly establishing that this movie was shot in 1989, we have the 89 Batman logo, which was prominent in Times Square at the time in anticipation for the film. I had to include it. Um, a, it's one of my all-time favourite films, and B, it ties in rather nicely with my Frankenhooker painting. If you look carefully at Frankenhooker, you can see it in the background there as well, so it tells us that both movies were filmed around about the same time. As they began shooting the movie, Hedden was anticipating the MPAA coming down on them over the violence, and so he filmed two versions of each kill. Barbara Sachs returned as producer and she was joined by Randy Shevladev, who had previously served as production manager on April Fool's Day 1986. Shevladev hoped to alter the mood of the film and told issue 85 of Fangoria magazine that the gore had now taken a back seat and that they were instead focusing on subtle scares. This one was not scored by Harry Manfredini, it was instead scored by Fred Mullen, who had previously worked as composer on Part 7 and the Friday the 13th series. He also co-wrote the song The Dark Side of the Night, which we hear during the opening credits, performed by the Canadian band Metropolis, which comprised of Peter Fredette and Stan Meisner. Meisner had written music for several TV shows and movies over the years, including Beverly Hills 90210, Forever Night, Tech War, Tales from the Crypt, Ghoulies 3, and also on Friday the 13th the series and Friday Part 7. They also wrote the song Broken Dream, which JJ is playing in the movie. The uh, vocals were actually performed by Terry Crawford. A longer instrumental version of this track would later be used on the first episode of Forever Night in 1992. It will come as no surprise to you that the classic Friday the 13th game released on the NES, uh, the same year as this movie in fact, was a big influence on this painting's colour scheme. I've always liked that blue and purple design. As for the movie's cast, having finished working on A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, producers offered the role of René to Lisa Wilcox, who turned it down, and then having apparently auditioned Pamela Anderson, Elizabeth Berkeley, and Dee Dee Pfeiffer, Michelle's sister, the role was given to Jansen Daggett. In their haste to find their leading lady, they forgot to cast an actress who would agree to do nudity for the film. Apparently Hedden tried to convince Daggett to go nude on several occasions, but she wasn't having any of it. However, his charms did work on Charlene Martin. When she expressed apprehension at being filmed nude for the shower scene, Hedden helped her overcome her inhibitions by stripping down and getting in the shower himself. Unaware that the camera was rolling, this caused some awkwardness when the movie's producers watched over the dailies the following morning. Scott Reeves played Rennie's love interest, Sean Roberts, but he wasn't the first actor hired for this role. Sean was originally played by an actor named Lee Coleman, who was replaced a few days into shooting as the producers felt there was no chemistry between him and Daggett. Before this role, Reeves had also worked on Big Man on Campus, which was released the same year as this, and for TV he appeared in Days of Our Lives and The Monsters Today. This is the part of the video in which I urge you to check out the rest of my channel and subscribe to it if you haven't already. You'll find other painted tributes to all manner of movies here, so please check out another video and support the channel. Thank you. Broken glass, um, try not to go overboard with this, but... Uh, and of course there must be a subway included somewhere. Um, I found a great article on Untapped New York regarding a vintage 1989 subway map that had been uncovered at Manhattan's Houston Street Station. I've tried to match it up best I can, the various station stops as they were then, along with the weathering. It's not completely accurate, I grant you, but it doesn't really matter as I will be covering it in graffiti. Graffiti, general disregard for property being another aspect that I want to add to this painting. Just like the street trash painting, I thought it would be fun to add the names of my kind patron supporters in the graffiti. Incidentally, um, on the subject of graffiti, in the movie we not only see graffiti reading Jason Lives, but we also see Quayton Lives. Apparently this was a reference to a high school band that Hedden was once in. 
Uh, different hand coming in now. This is my daughter. She wanted to add her initials. Well, I know I don't usually sign these until the very end, but... Uh, as for the rest of the movie's cast, there was... V.C. Dupree played Julius, the boxer who loses his head just before the end of the movie. He had appeared in various TV shows before this, including an episode of Freddy's Nightmares, and apparently he showed up for his audition dressed in several layers of clothing to make himself look more like a boxer. It wasn't until they started filming that he realised he was actually working on a Friday the 13th movie. He'd been taken in by the Ashes to Ashes title. For that now iconic scene, VC was really punching Jason. A professional boxer was used for the long shots, but for the close-ups, that was him, and his knuckles were genuinely swollen from all the punching. This movie had such a large cast, um, it feels wrong to just skim through their careers. Particularly Peter Mark Richmond, who probably holds the record for the longest career list on IMDb. It would take me another three painting videos just to get through all the TV roles he's had. And then we have the legend that is Kane Hodder, returning as Jason. As the film went into production, the studio had just assumed that Kane would not be interested in playing the character again. Uh, they were wrong. Canadian actor Ken Kurzinger was being considered until Kane made his interest in returning known to Paramount. Kurzinger was still in the movie though. Um, he played the big man at the diner that Jason throws against the mirror. He also doubled for Jason in a few shots, which is interesting when you consider that he would later play Jason in Freddy vs. Jason in 2003. Hodder had a feel for this character and I have to admit I think he's one of my favourites as well. There's a real menace and anger to his performance um, but uh, he would make suggestions during filming um, such as requesting that a scene involving Jason kicking a dog be dropped. The multifaceted actor was also able to use a trick that he'd learned. He revealed in issue 86 of Fangoria magazine that he had the ability to vomit fluids on cue. So when you see water coming out of Jason's mouth, that wasn't a special effect. Kane actually did this himself by drinking two pitchers of water before the cameras rolled. But when you are covered in slime, being hit repeatedly by VC Dupree or 2,000 gallons of water, he was signing autographs, posing for photos with cops, but it was filming on location on Times Square that he considered to be a career highlight. Standing there in full Jason garb, he would slowly turn and stare at the thousands of fans lining the streets watching filming, and uh, the crowds would just go wild. With production finished, Jason Takes Manhattan was trimmed down for time, and it seems that the MPAA were determined to stick it to Jason, making the advertising of Part 8 difficult. As their powers also extended to the way movies were promoted, they took issue with the original one sheet created by the studio that had Jason tearing through the famous I Heart New York logo with a bloody knife. Paramount had to resubmit a new bloodless version of the poster to them before it could be approved. Then, having made the changes, the posters were being circulated across the country when the New York City Council Board of Tourism filed a complaint against Paramount for using their I Heart New York. And so a third poster had to be created in time for the movie's release on the 28th of July 1989. Jason Takes Manhattan managed to gross 14.3 million, but it was still the poorest performing film of the franchise. It received negative reviews by the critics and fans who were disappointed at how little Manhattan taking actually took place. Apparently Entertainment Weekly reportedly called it the 8th worst sequel ever made. Paramount disappointed at the movie's box office returns, lost interest in the franchise and they sold it to New Line Cinema. Jason was off to hell to meet Freddy. As for Rob Hedden, he went off to write and direct TV movies such as Knight Rider 2000 in 1991, The Return of Ironside in 1993 and Simon and Simon Together Again for CBS in 1995 along with The Colony and Kidnapped. There was Alien Fury Countdown to Invasion in 2000 and he wrote an episode for the Twilight Zone revival in 2002 and directed an episode of Star Trek Enterprise called Fusion. That same year, the Nickelodeon Paramount feature film Clockstoppers that he co-wrote and co-produced was released. He wrote, directed and co-produced the independent comedy Box Borders in 2007 and the romantic comedy You May Not Kiss the Bride that he both wrote and directed was released in 2011. 
I've seen it written that he distances himself from Jason Takes Manhattan, but I don't believe this. He featured on the 2013 documentary Crystal Lake Memories, The Complete History of Friday the 13th, where he shared stories about the making of the film and seemingly laughing off the movie's apparent flaws. I have no issue with this one, in fact it's one of the earliest I saw. I heart Jason Takes Manhattan. And that, dear viewer, is that. Thank you for joining me today and keeping me company. As ever, I hope that was of interest to you and I hope you approve of the final painting. If so, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, give the video a thumbs up, share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. A big thank you to Alex Taylor for supporting the channel and for picking this month's movie. If you would like to follow his example and join the Vidorama Video Club, you'll find the link in the description. The next Friday the 13th will be in October of this year, so which Friday movie shall I paint? Let me know in the comments and check out the community tab. There is a poll there. You can pick your favourite there as well. So until next time, dear viewer, thank you very much for joining me. And until next time, good night out there, whatever you are. <laughs>